Hello everybody, my name is Allison Harrell, and today we are gonna be talking about empresarios. Now, the first thing we have to go over is what is an empresario? So an empresario is someone that was given a contract by the Mexican government to bring settlers to Texas. Now, the Imperial Colonization Law of 1823 laid out all the details of the empresario contract. So every empresario had a specific timeline of how long they had to bring a specific number of people and that number increased or decreased depending on the land that they were given. So everyone was given their own chunk of land and a goal number to hit and they were required to bring that number of settlers to Texas before their contract ended. Now, not many empresarios actually achieve that. Not many people manage to get the required number in, but um, a lot of people did try. One of the other interesting things that was um, mandated in the Imperial Colonization Law of 1823 is that all of those settlers had to be practicing Roman Catholics. So that is one of the few rules that most empresarios broke constantly because not many people that came to Texas, especially from the United States, were actually practicing Roman Catholics. So they were all kind of illegal. Now, um, before we get into the specific people who were the empresarios and where they were and what they did, I wanna give you a little note. So the Mexican government actually made a number of laws about colonization and about land grants. So every couple of years, the laws changed because after Mexico gained its independence from Spain, they had a lot of turmoil in their government and a lot of turnover. So every new government or every new leader created new land laws, which meant that all of the laws of Texas were constantly changing. So even though I'm referencing the Imperial Colonization Law of 1823, that was not the first or the last of the laws that govern Texas about land usage and land distribution. And those changing laws are part of what caused the Texas Revolution. So we're gonna get into more detail about those laws and how they changed and how that frustrated people in the October podcast. So be looking out for that, um, which is why I'm not going into detail now. So there were three different units of land, essentially. You could get a labor of land, which is 177 acres. You could get a league of land, which is 4,428 acres, or you could get a hacienda of land, which is actually five leagues. So that is 22,140 acres of land. And if you need a good size comparison, an acre is about the size of a football field. When you hear the words empresario in Texas, I hope that you immediately think of Stephen F. Austin. He's the most well-known and most successful empresario that operated in Texas. Now, this video is not about him. We have an entire another video all about Stephen F. Austin, so I'm not gonna talk about him at all. I'm gonna talk about a number of other empresarios that were operating in Texas. Now, the empresario system actually kept operating in Texas even after the Texas Revolution. So today, I'm only gonna be talking about those empresarios that operated under that imperial colonization rule of 1823. So first up, I'm gonna start off with a number of partnerships. So the first partnership we have is Benjamin Lovell and John Purnell. And I have heard tell that they were trying to start a socialist colony in Texas. So they got their grant, Purnell went to check out the land, and Lovell went to New York City to gather funds and get financers and to, um, you know, spread the word about what they were gonna do, and Purnell died. So Lovell sold the contract to someone else and never came back to Texas. Now, the other two partnerships are, to me, a lot more entertaining than that one, but I wanted to mention that one first. Sort of set the bar low. The next partnership empresario grant I have to talk about is John McMullen and James McGloin. Now, these were two Irishmen that met each other while working in Matamortis, Mexico. And uh, so they were both working there in the 1820s. They met each other and they decided to get an empresario grant together. 
They were given the task of bringing 200 families to the left bank of the Nueces River in 1828. Ultimately, they only managed to get 84 colonists. Um, most of these colonists were Irish. And during and immediately after the Texas Revolution, these two guys both moved to San Antonio for safety. So ultimately, James McMullen was killed by an unknown assassin while in San Antonio, while James McLoyne did end up moving back to his grant and did live there until he died. Next is James Power and James Hewitson. Again, these are both Irishmen, which I find very entertaining. But unlike the last two, these actually moved from Ireland to the United States. So they both moved to the US. They were both working one in St. Louis and one in New Orleans as merchants. And they both independently heard about Stephen F. Austin and his land grants. And so they decided they were also gonna become empresarios. So they moved to Mexico. And so they moved to Mexico, started becoming merchants there. And then they met each other and they decided that they were gonna get a land grant together. So they did. Now, um, in 1826 is when they got their empresario grant to settle 200 families. And James Power ended up becoming involved in the Texas Revolution. He ended up um, helping out with the different conventions and with different parts of the war. And James Hewitson, never even came to his Texas land. He ended up staying in Mexico. So after he died, his wife's family is the one who got that land in Texas ultimately. So kind of a different take. One came to Texas, one became heavily involved, and the other one never even made it here. So the next two empresarios did not have a partnership with each other, but they did ultimately do the same thing with their empresario grant. So I wanted to tell you about them back to back so you could see the differences. The first is David Burnett. He was born in New Jersey. He was the 14th child born in the family. So he had a pretty big family. And his father and a lot of his older brothers had done pretty significant things in the American Revolution. So he had a lot to live up to. It said that he strove to live up to the achievement that his father and brothers had managed in their lifetime, but his life instead was a series of disappointments. So he was given a land grant to bring 200 families and he struggled. He tried to find families, he tried to find financial backers, and just every single way he could possibly struggle, he did. So he ultimately went to New York to try and find financiers for his grant. So he ends up just selling his contract and moving on. Now, another empresario who does the same thing, sells his contract and moves on, actually has a much more impressive life. So while David Burnett's life was a series of disappointments, Lorenzo Di Zavala's life was a series of um, political masterstrokes, is how I'm going to put it. So he was born in Mexico, and he lived a very political life. He graduated from seminary. He ended up starting three different Democratic newspapers. Ultimately, his political views got him jailed for a number of years. And while he was in jail, he managed to read enough medical texts that he became a doctor and he taught himself English while in jail. So after he got out of jail, he served a number of government positions in Mexico until the centralist um, government took over. So when the centralist movement took over, he ended up leaving Mexico because they didn't want him, they didn't like his policies. And so that's when he got his empresario grant. So he was trying to find settlers and trying to find financiers like David Burnett. He ends up going to New York and he also sells his grant to the Galveston Bay, Texas Land Company. So while David Burnett was a series of disappointments, Lorenzo Di Zavallo was a series of triumphs, but um, due to some temporary setbacks, they both end up selling their land grant. So next up we have Martin De Leon. Now De Leon is considered the most successful Mexican empresario and that's because he was very successful as an empresario, unlike Zavala, who's very successful and an empresario. So De Leon actually did manage to bring settlers to Texas. He created the only Mexican colony under the empresario system. And so his colony was actually given um, special privileges. An interesting note about De Leon's life is the fact that he was one of those American born Spaniards. So his parents were both from Spain. They were from a prominent family in Spain, the De Leon family. And when they moved to Mexico and to America and had their son, that automatically made him a lower class citizen 
who was never able to go above the rank of captain in the military because of the location of his birth. Now, um, he was not at all bothered by this, or if he was, he didn't let it stop him. He ended up being in the military. He got up to a captain, which is the highest rank he could go. And then he became a merchant for a while before ultimately deciding to settle in Texas. He ended up petitioning the Mexican government for a number of years to get an empresario grant before they were even a thing. So he asked if he could bring settlers to Texas starting in 1809. He ultimately got his empresario grant in 1826, and he was tasked with bringing settlers to the Nueces River. So actually right around the area where he had his land. And he was one of those few people that had that Hacienda grant. So he did have the 22,000 acres of land. Now, De Leon started a sort of Texas, Texas tradition of having a lot of land and putting a lot of cows on it and then raising those cows and ultimately driving those cows to New Orleans for, um, to sell them at market. So he sort of started the Texas tradition of large ranches and the Texas tradition of cattle drives. Um, ultimately, his ranch was not as big as some are today and some went on to later be, but his was pretty significant as well. Now, most of the settlers that he brought ended up living around the town that he ended up starting, which we now know as Victoria. The next man on my list is a guy named Green DeWitt. Now, he was another one of those people that was inspired by Stephen F. Austin to become an empresario. So he ends up coming to Texas, he gets his empresario contract in 1824, and he's supposed to start bringing families in. He ultimately does bring some families in. His grant ends up settling in the town of Gonzales, which is where his family ends up living. But he's never able to get enough families in. He's never able to get the financial backing that he needs. Um, ultimately, at one point, his wife uh, petitions to get a grant in her maiden name, specifically to save their family from the poverty of her husband's actions. And that is written in the petition, and he also supported this um, petition. So she was ultimately given a league of her own land, even though they were married, just because the family was doing so badly financially. Uh, just a quick note about Green DeWitt. He ultimately died right before the Texas Revolution, but that doesn't mean that his family didn't play a huge part in the Texas Revolution because they lived in Gonzales, which is where the first sort of battle takes place. That come and take it flag that becomes really famous and a rallying cry for the Texas Revolution was actually made out of his daughter's wedding dress. So his wife and his daughter made the flag out of the wedding dress and were a huge part of the revolution, even though Green did not do so well financially as an empresario. So the last empresario on my list is a man named Hayden Edwards, and he had one of the most unique problems of any of the empresarios, which that his grant was right around the town of Nacogdoches. So his grant was around a town that is already established, it already has people living in it, and part of the contract stipulates that he must respect and um, allow anyone that's living there to stay where they are. So he can't move anybody, which means that when he goes to town, he goes to Nacogdoches, he ends up having to ask the people, what are the boundaries of your land? Where are you living? Please let me know. And it became a struggle from the get-go of trying to get people to talk to him and trying to get people to tell him where they lived just so that he didn't give away anyone's land, which ended up creating a lot of friction. Ultimately, his empresario contract got pulled three years after it was given. So he was no longer allowed to be an empresario, no longer allowed to bring people to Texas, but that ended up just kind of frustrating him even more. So he ended up being a part of what's known as the Fredonia Rebellion, which we're gonna talk more about when we get closer to the Texas Revolution, but I just wanna kind of mention it here. So Hayden Edwards not only was a part of the Fredonia Rebellion, he led the Fredonia Rebellion. And this made, um, this ended up with Mexico um, expelling him from the country. So he was no longer allowed in Texas. He ended up fleeing to Louisiana for safety. And ultimately he returned to Texas during and after the Texas Revolution and ends up back in Nacogdoches where he lives out the rest of his days, but he did have to flee for a while. So is it interesting to note that um, the empresarios were contracted to bring people, but that didn't mean they weren't revolutionary. That didn't mean that they weren't political and it didn't mean that they succeeded either financially or um, within the bounds of their contract. So that's all the impresarios that I have for you today.